Hello and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London and today's episode is brought to you from Cardiff. I'm currently in the middle of a tour. I'm not going to lie, I am pretty knackered. When you've been in five cities in as many days, it's no surprise. And at the time of recording this, I still have four more days. <laughs> I've learned a lot about my energy levels and capacity in the last few days, namely that I need my own space from time to time. As lovely as it is to go out for a drink, sometimes you just need to go back to your hotel room and not do anything. I feel like it's hard for people to admit this, but have you ever been in a large group of people and felt overwhelmed that everyone already seems to know each other and that everyone seems to be going out every single night? That feeling of FOMO, fear of missing out for the uninitiated. When people are like, yeah, yeah, really big one last night. And then you just start thinking, oh, God, oh, should I have gone out last night? The thing is, you only hear from those people. And the ones who stay out till 5 a.m. every night, the ones with the constant bus banter, these people with a high capacity for activity and livers of steel are the ones who are more likely to broadcast their actions. You definitely hear less from those who have a quiet drink from the rider and then return to their hotel room to eat snacks and watch TV. While I think it's fine to go out all night if you want to do that, I do think more people are of the retiring and reserved nature than we realise. But of course, you can't tell people at the pub that you're not at the pub if you're not at the pub, you know. So <laughs> this is a shout out to all the quiet ones on tour, the ones who are happy in their own space, the ones who need longer to recharge their batteries, and the ones who can't wait to get into their pyjamas and curl up into bed. My guest this episode, and next episode, because this is a two-parter, is Daniel Elms, the composer of my podcast jingle, my Jingle Elms, if you like. I caught up with Dan on a day off. I'd like to say that I just decided to pop down to Brighton for the day, but of course it wasn't that easy. There was a whole back and forth with proposed dates and times. I mean, it's a miracle when two freelance musicians decide a date a month in advance and actually stick to it without having to change plans. In part one of our chat, we talk about how Dan works with media composition briefs, anxiety within creative processes, and his recently released album. But of course, we start our pastry and oat milk coffee fueled conversation by talking about some unrelated things, probably as a result of me having been, again, to five different cities in as many days. This is becoming a monthly occurrence. Anyway, here it is. <laughs> And then I, after the show, finished at like 10 past 10, so then I drove two hours to Amesbury, which is where my hotel was, because I didn't want to drive all the way back to London. Oh my days. That's mad. So mm. you drove two hours after the show just to sleep? Basically, yeah. Because I've done, I've done the drive. <laughs> mad. Just so desperate to sleep. <laughs> Could sleep in the car. But I, I hate driving from Exeter to London. It's just too far. Is it? Where is Exeter? Devon. So oh, West Jesus. Country, okay. yeah, the gateway to Cornwall. I'm oh, mad. For some reason in my mind, oh, I'm confusing it with. I think it's called. I think it's called Hexham, which is up in Newcastle. For some reason, I swap the two places around in my mind. <laughs> Geographically <laughs> off. <laughs> Complete different end of the country. That is. Complete that different is, accents as well. It would be yeah, from like from like Geordie going, oh, welcome to welcome to Exeter, lovely. <laughs> You've been driving two hours. Must be a knackered. I like that. Is that sort of your neck of the wood? No, that's too it's far. That's where my mum comes from, yeah. My yeah. mum's sort of from South Shields, so she's not an actual Geordie. She's like a pretend Geordie. Okay. Um, I don't really understand what a Geordie accent is. Well, it's just that. It's just like well-meaning noise. I think I'm allowed to say that, being like derived <laughs> from a Geordie family. I think I'm allowed to say that. Like most <laughs> of my relatives are Geordie. So what is like ill-meaning noise, I wonder? <laughs> ill-meaning noise? I don't know. Like aggressive noise. Maybe just like static yeah. or something. But if you just remove some frequencies from white noise, you get Geordie. <laughs> and then it's well-meaning. And then it's well-meaning noise. <laughs> I like that. The whole time when, you know, when you're growing up and you turn on a TV station and there's... That's it. Just Geordie's. Is, is, is Geordie's just trying to say something That's well-meaning. That's it. Just very happy Geordie's yeah. just trying to vie for your attention. And the frequencies just weren't quite getting That's through. That's it. That's it. 
Well, now we've got the technology, I'm sure, to isolate that. That's it. Figure out what you it means. You just strip it down and they're like, oh, just treat yourself to the sofa. That was an awful accent. I apologize. I don't know what that is. But... That was the worst impression I think I've ever done. I like that Thank very you. much. So, Daniel Alps, welcome to the podcast. Oh my God, this is actually on. I didn't. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Quite good. I do have That's to turn fine. on the microphones in order to record a podcast. That's fine. No, I didn't yeah. realize that the. Uh, is, I should have just looked at the red light. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the, my Geordie family are not talking to us again after that. That's fine. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Pleasure. Thanks for having me in your wonderful flat, which you've recently moved into here in Hove. That's the one. Yeah. Yes. How's everything been for you since moving? Yeah, it's been very good. Rapidly expanding waistline <laughs> since moving here because there's just like, well, we've got a bunch of pastries on the table now. We do. This is just a sample of the quality produce available. Would you like to explain to listeners what we are munching on currently? Yeah, so we are operating an almond croissant, but then throwing it into the mix, we've got an almond pan au chocolat, mm. which is like a pan au chocolat with almond. It's like a combination of two great It's things. mad. It is yeah. literally mad, though. Yeah. Like, I know you've not tried that bit yet. No, it looks a bit squashed. It, it does be? look a bit squashed. That yeah. might be because it was in my bag. It might be just the way they prepare them in right. this place. I can still see the lamination in the pastry. Classic. <laughs> Someone's been watching Bake Off. I actually haven't. Have you not? <laughs> no, I've, I haven't had time to watch anything oh, no. recently. How do you know about lamination? Because of previous seasons of Bake Off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. That's fine. It's been going for several years, I believe. Yeah, no, it's been going a long time. But they're always on about lamination, aren't they? You've yeah. got to get the lamination... That's a good word for Geordie. Lamination. That is a great word for Geordie. I'll ask my cousins to say it next time I see him. I like the way that Paul Hollywood says it, because he's from Liverpool, he is which from... I know is completely different. But I like how he says, overworked. Overwork. You've overworked, you do. It's really hard accent, though, isn't it? That sounded pretty good. And my mate Tom used to live opposite a Liverpoolian in a flat in Crystal Palace. And I remember that he said that one day they just sort of like burst into his room and was like, oh, I love saxophone. It's like <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it just sounds like there's something in their mouth all the time. It's intense, isn't it? Yeah. Saxophone. <laughs> it's a tricky accent to do, yeah. Yeah, I can't describe. It's almost like you have to speak with your cheeks sort of clenched. I wish people constantly. could see your face as you do this. It's quite good. <laughs> Would you like to describe? <laughs> just like very Choppy. Choppy. Choppy is the way I can describe it. I'd say I'm almost like hissing like a cat. <sighs> like a cat. Yeah, yeah, cat chop. You've got a cat chop to get your Liverpoolian accent on. A whole accent's easy to do. You just, so you know how like umlauts work in German. Mm -hmm. So you just use those for like most things. Right. So phone isn't yeah. phone. It's yeah. fern. Fern. Yeah. Oh, you just sound a little bit... Uh, so if you say the fern. best one is toad of toad hall... Which is turd of turd earl, which sounds like turd of turd hurl. <laughs> I like that very much. It's nice. Turd. Turd. Oh, perfect. Yeah, nailed turd. it. What's another good one? Oh, so check this out. You know, you know the song by ABBA, mm -hmm. Mamma Mia. <laughs> yep. Say it. Mamma Mia. Which is hull for Mum, I'm over here. <laughs> Mamma Mia. <laughs> oh my god, that's perfect. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's treating you. Oh, it's I read something funny like that, like, oh, I can't remember exactly how it is, but to say something in Scottish, you just say... Oh. Space ghetto. Yeah. Sounds like saying spice girl. Yeah, that's right. Spice girl. Spice girl. Space, space ghetto. Space ghetto. But in what accent is that? I don't... <laughs> <laughs> to me, it just sounds like we're both saying space ghetto. Space ghetto. Space ghetto. So, oh, I think you have to say it in an American accent. Space ghetto. Space oh, God. ghetto. Oh, Yeah. Space ghetto. Oh, that's weird. Oh, it's like an oral illusion. That so. is mad, yeah. Crazy. Psychoacoustics <laughs> all over it. Yeah. That's madness. Story, like of, that, story of my life, basically. Just amalgamating my voice into various accents. Oh, it's, oh so I do that all the time. I'm really bad with that. When we, when we first moved to Greenwich back in, whenever we moved there, 2012, I went down to like the grocer and there's a really nice guy there called Aid who runs this... I won't share the name of the of the <laughs> of the building in case people visit it, but it's a really nice uh, it's a really nice grocery shop, and he's like this really broad Cockney accent that he has, and like the first thing I said to him was immediately in a Cockney accent, 
and I had an entire conversation of me buying like however many potatoes and like I think a bag of mushrooms like in a Cockney accent and he was obviously very taken with it because he's like where are you from mate and I'm like oh Yorkshire and he was just like looking at me with like just such dismay oh no like you know when you crack an egg in the morning mm. and you break it and it's like written your day off oh that's really sad yeah yeah it was like that he was looking at me like you lied to me you popped his yoke that's it that's <laughs> That does not sound that's good. That's graphic. Yeah, it is. That's fine. Yeah, I find myself doing people's accents, especially if they're Australian. Is it? Yeah, they'll say, they'll just make some kind of noise at me and I'll be like, oh, yeah. And it's, just, it's like an echo chamber. <laughs> Do just... Kath and Kim it. <laughs> it's nice. It's different. It's unusual. <laughs> it's really statue of baby Jesus, not baby <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> baby Jesus, Kim. Oh, Jesus. I think that's got to be one of my favourite Kath and Kim moments. That is amazing. That is wonderful. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Kim? <laughs> well, we'd better get on. Let, shall we crack on with the yeah, interview? let's crack on. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, all good. No, I like this. I like this very much. I like this <laughs> freestyling. <laughs> so, keen listeners will know that you've actually featured on every single one of my podcast episodes because you wrote my jingle. That's correct. Yeah, I call you Jingle Elms. Jingle Elms. Yeah, yeah it's a classic song mm -hmm. jingle to be sung Elms. around the festive season. Yeah. So how do you find composing for particular briefs? For example, from a very rookie podcaster who <laughs> offers you a brief that is very, very <laughs> abstract. I mean, I think I just basically said to you, I would like a jingle, please. Make it sound cool. Make it sound not like classic FM. Briefs are weird. Briefs are weird. Just talking into the microphone there. Yes. Adjustment. Adjusted. Um, briefs can be strange because it's like, it's very dependent on who who is at the other end of it. Mm. Um, so obviously in your case, I knew there was like a very competent musician at the other end of it. Is that Aww. the worst description or is that? Thank you. That's very oh, kind. Oh, that's a nice description. <laughs> I thought you were like, how dare you? What? Call me competent. Very competent. Very it's competent. It's not the most, now I've said it again, it <laughs> doesn't sound like the most flattering. Well, phrase. I think I would have been quite surprised if you called me the most competent. The most because competent. Because that's um, superlative, definitely. Okay. <laughs> okay. The suggestions that you had meant you had a sound world in mind that you were kind of after. Mm. And there was kind of very little throwing ideas back and forth because it was very easy to kind of land upon what you wanted mm -hmm. quite, quite soon which in my mind was something quite eclectic and yeah. not traditional not traditional but was sort of a kind of a hodgepodge if you like of different sounds so there's some some jazzy elements in there there's some uh some electronic there are some strings as well ducked beneath the surface miles and miles away um are they still there yeah, they are. No, they're they're sort of just hiding in the background. I on think one of them. Maybe I got rid of them, didn't you? Didn't deleted them. No, I got rid of the effects. Oh yeah, yeah. There was like an audience clapping at one point. I just thought it was good for like hype. You know what I mean? Right. Welcome <laughs> to the podcast. Just like <laughs> build build the hype before the podcast. That's it. Just have like a little. That's it. Just like audience cheer or something to answer your question and not just ramble on. So the brief is very dependent. On who's at the other end like I said and how you answer it really is the sort of dark art of working on media things which I kind of split my time between concert and media work um, I'd say my focus is on concert and then I take on more media things if I find them interesting and I found that the dark art of the the brief side of things is that it's very easy to hear the final result but what you don't hear often is is the means by which the composer got to that point so for instance on a lot of films i remember when i first graduated and and sort of landed some assistant positions and would be doing like a recording and there'd be a t certain queue and i'd be like this is literally one page of like tied semi briefs at the octave like a, a child could have written this accidentally but then but like which is which is unfair of course but the but you know everyone's sort of a bit feisty when they emerge from mm -hmm. from music school like i can do this but the the point being is that like there's like the negotiation that happens after the brief yeah. and like you don't know the processes by which people arrived at the fact that this octave that lasts for like a minute is is what was required by <laughs> this is the end result this is exactly what i need throwing 
back and forth loads and loads of ideas. Yeah. And you, yeah, don't, yeah. you don't see that, do you? It's like the tip no. of the iceberg. I'm thinking about this because I've just played Titanic last weekend. That's <laughs> a classic <laughs> reference. So, but there's all that work that's happening under the surface. Yeah. There's like, there is, there is in a lot of media productions, there's like a lot of, for lack of a better term, there's like a la- lack of politics. And part of how you sort of manage that is, is part of the skill set, which is not necessarily why everyone can work in that environment because it requires, it requires compromise on occasion, but it also requires like, a good amount of diplomacy mm-hmm. and, and things like that. So how do you work with, when you get a brief from someone who, for example, wouldn't use any musical terms at all, mm-hmm. really, really abstract ideas, mm. how much of your own creativity can you sort of push onto them? Mm, that's a good question. So in a way, I've often found that like the less specific musical terms that are used, it's usually easier Um Especially not in your case, not in your case, Davina. Um, but <laughs> Please like, don't make it sound no, like no, classic FM. No, no, no. Like, um, like, like, so for instance, if someone if someone is struggling with musical terms, it's probably better that they just don't use it rather than use it. I remember speaking to one person saying that they're, they're asking for something very floaty and like breathy sounding, and I was like, instantly, like, yeah, let's get a flute in there. That oh, sounds that's great. Good. Actually, that that does work, doesn't it? Because it's just relating the non-musical side to yeah to the musical in theory it works mm-hmm. but then i played them a flute and they're like i hate flutes and i was like <laughs> what okay when you, i was like well what are you what are you talking about then and they're like more like this and they played it double bass <laughs> i was like that is not that is not breathy or light that you just played. It was a particularly like... Oh my gosh, a, a bass with like loads of pops rosin on it or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was just like... It's like okay. Is that your definition of floaty? The hmm. floaty. So like, I mean, I'm being, I'm, I'm being like a bit obtuse, but like, I mean, well, I'm not because that did happen. But, but at the same time, like, it's kind of, it, it comes to a point where you've just got to spend time with the person and sort of work out what their vocabulary actually translates as musical terms yeah and some sometimes it works some sometimes you hit it off immediately yeah and sometimes it takes uh sometimes it takes a huge amount of back and forth of trial and error and i think especially with a lot of like especially with a lot of young composers when they're first doing anything to brief um you know the first time you get like a sort of no that's not right you're like oh I've been blacklisted from the industry forever. And it's like, you've, you, of course you haven't, but it's, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, you know. It's just the first step, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, and sometimes it's just not going to work out. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. Yep. That's just what happens. Yeah. Um, you just have to talk to the person and you have to yeah, communicate. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, if it doesn't work out because you just can't see eye to eye or you just can't kind of decrypt what it is that they that they want, then that's absolutely fine because not every... Not every artistic vision in a different medium will always match with the mm. musical voice of yeah. a given composer. And that's probably for the best, isn't it? It is for the best, because yeah, absolutely. can you imagine working on a project, doing something that you just completely disagreed with and, yeah. and you absolutely hated and then the other party wasn't happy as well and you just have two really... Well, exactly, you yeah. You know, two camps which are really discon- uh, which discontent. are really discontent, is that a discontent. word? Discontent, yeah, Dis- which are really not content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that does happen. I mean, that's part of the reason why I focus a lot on concert music is because I am fundamentally just accountable to myself with that. Mm-hmm. Like I am the the brief quote unquote is like just a topic or something that I want to comment on musically. Yep. Whereas many years ago, I was working for a guy and he was asked to a brief had come in and he was asked to kind of put together a collection of material to s- suggest what he might do musically for this particular brief that had come in. It was a feature film. And so I was asked like, can you just pull out some stuff from the back catalogue and we'll have a listen and then kind of shape it up and send it across to them so they can kind of get a feel of where we're coming from. So I was like, yeah, that's fine. So spent like an hour or so kind of going through the back catalogue and pulled out a bunch of material that was like to the brief. I can't remember exactly what the the kind of brief was but anyway I, I played it back with this person and i was like there must have been like 10 15 tracks and i was like track one and they're like no it's rubbish get rid of it i was like okay track two and they're like oh no it's awful get rid of that and it was like okay and so we went through like 
all of this list and there was maybe like just one track that was like reasonable enough to be included <laughs> in their opinion and that but that it, the reason why i mention this is because it comes from that um it comes from this thing of this particular person at the time had been like chasing not the musical result of working on a project but using that project as a stepping to- stone to something else so they weren't necessarily finishing a project and feeling content with what they'd written they were kind of in some cases hitting like the lowest common denominator of what this person had what this director had requested and were really just sort of kind of chasing awards or the next bigger and better project and the result is is that the musical output that you're getting from that you're not satisfied with now i think i think anyone i think anyone in any creative art has a has a point where you finish something and you're really pleased with it for a period of time which is very fleeting. And then like a few days later, you're like, that is rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> On to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then I, but what I do find though with that, the caveat is, is that I do find if you have done your best at a given moment, there will come a point in time where you look back on it and you can kind of accept it for what it is. Mm-hmm. But what I saw in this example that I mentioned was someone that was unable to accept what it is they'd written because they'd know they hadn't delivered it. Right. In the first place. And I was kind of like, I don't I don't want that to happen. That's not really fair on themselves or the other party, yeah, is it? Yeah, exactly. Like I kind of, you know, I'd kind of, I wanted to take, a, it's unfair to say more pride in my work, but I just kind of wanted to look back and just be satisfied with mm. what it was that I'd done musically. So that kind of prompted a big shift in my disposition of work. Is it a bit like if you were a performer and you're doing, you're taking on certain gigs where your your heart's not really in it, it's not particularly fulfilling work? Yeah. Because you know that if you keep doing it, something else might come along later. Yeah. Along the line. Exactly. Or or the gig you're doing is like you don't enjoy it, but it's like it's like a quote unquote a named gig, and <laughs> right. it's like you should be you should be happy to be on it, but mm-hmm. realistically, you're not. And I I think especially music, that's a huge. That's a huge thing because jobs can be so few and far between and it can be very competitive to get them. I found a lot of people, whether they're composers or performers, they're kind of, they'll be chasing after something because it's what they've thought of, it's always that they wanted to do. Yeah. And then they kind of get there and then after a period of time, they kind of realise it's not for them. Yeah. And then it's at that point, it's like you either make a change or you just accept it. And like I've unfortunately met a lot of people who have just accepted it and gone with it because mm-hmm. it's kind of it's what they thought was expected of them. And then they're really unhappy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. And it's but the thing is, is that it's un, it's also unfair to kind of to to shame these people because oh. it's <laughs> like because it is the hardest thing to be that honest with yourself. Yeah. If you've spent like a decade pursuing something mm-hmm. and you get there and you're like, I'm not feeling this. And of course, as well, like you, you're going to be immersed in a world where your peers are sort of competing for the same thing to turn around and be like, no, actually, especially in music, there's like a big feeling of like, well, you must have failed if you change your mind. (laughs) And it's like, well, no. (laughs) And what are you throwing away? Are you not grateful for this opportunity? Yeah, exactly. And I suppose there there is that as well, but often you don't realize how unhappy you are until you make that step and and you look at yourself and you think, this is not good for my mental health. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a huge, a huge thing. Is is mental health? I still, it's got much better in recent years. People talking about it, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of musicians are more ready than others to talk about it. Especially due to everyone knows the stresses that performance yeah. has. But still, it's still something of like a, you know, a kind a of, bit of a stigma. Frowned upon. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's completely wrong that it is. It's, well, I think it's good that musicians are becoming more ready to talk about it mm. because we have to live with our hearts and our sleeves yeah. and a lot of what we do and our creative output. And if you're performing, everything that you put into a performance or everything that you put into your own yeah. uh, composition, yeah, you know, if you can do it in the medium of music, then why mm. not just talk about it? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, yeah, it took me it took me a long time before I was happy to kind of. So I, I suffer. So a lot from anxiety i'm a very anxious person when it comes especially when it comes to music and it took me it took me years of i mean i've been how long have i been i've been writing music for nearly 20 years now and like it took me years before i'd be kind of willing to i don't know maybe show some pieces to people Mm -hmm. or would be willing to kind of commit to a piece to an extent that you know 
say this is a piece by me kind of thing because it's there are so many sort of so many inner battles that you're fighting about yeah. it with yourself that if someone calls you out on it it's like you know it'd yeah. be the worst thing into it took yeah it, you're it, putting yourself in a really vulnerable position by showcasing yeah, your work absolutely and yeah. that can it's like standing naked on a mountaintop and, yeah 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 it's the same with any it's the same with performing repertoire that you're really passionate about it's mm-hmm. it's you know it's your interpretation of the music and you know some people might not agree with your interpretation they might not like it and it's like it is a horrendously exposing to p- position to put yourself in and it's the i know countless people that are like you know i would i would rather be hit by like a car walk into my performance than actually do this performance oh my goodness and it's it's it is kind of terrifying that that's the mentality but i yeah. don't know through persistence or something you kind of end up getting around it or getting over it or or at least kind of getting to a point where you you're willing just to do it anyway and mm-hmm. sort of accept what the fallout is and having faith in your own abilities i think yeah. that's a real quite an important thing mm. because everyone goes through experiences where they feel like yeah. they're not good enough or an imposter syndrome but then just by creating something that you're that you've put a lot of time and effort into and feeling genuinely proud of it even if it's just for that fleeting moment as you mentioned yeah I would imagine it's a step towards building up that confidence yeah. in what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd agree. Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so speaking of your creative output, you recently released your debut album. Yes. You looked at me as if you were really surprised. Just like, Did I? <laughs> what? What? Eyes wide open. So you released your debut album, Islandia. Yes. Got the pronunciation right. Nailed that. Well, I remember because I had to say it in the very, very first podcast episode. Oh, really? And, and you're like, Islandia. Yeah, well, I did think. I was like, is it Islandia? <laughs> is the S silent? I don't know. So I think I sent you a WhatsApp voice. Oh, you did? Yeah, you I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, is this right? <laughs> Islandia? I love it. <laughs> but I got right. So Islandia yep. is the name of the album. Yep. And you got a record deal with mm. New Amsterdam Records, who are based in Brooklyn, mm. New York. New York. How did you come about getting a record deal? That's incredible. Um, well, well <laughs> it's kind of mad, yeah. New Amsterdam operate on a basis where they put out individual albums. No one basically signs to them as like a signed artist. They kind of endorse specific records if you like mm-hmm. yeah that was kind of a it was kind of a mad story really so i sort of set myself a i set set myself the brief of of finishing the recording uh, i just sort of i how I, was it working with yourself did you it's say- an absolute nightmare <laughs> it's mad like oh let's let's do some work yeah i could could just go get an almond cross on though couldn't i so uh no it's all right but like i need to there's the sort of inner battles that I mentioned that you kind of have to get over. And the best things that I found is set a deadline and sort of set something hard in stone, which means that you can't just keep shifting it. Oh, gosh. So in this case, I just booked a recording session and was like, right. it has to be ready. That's um, a pretty set deadline to yeah, give yourself. Yeah. I find often setting a deadline and putting it online right. is a good... That's a good shout. Yeah, yeah. it's good motivation. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that and I think the best thing I've found is actually just showing up because like for a long time, I'd kind of sit around waiting for like inspiration to strike and like occasionally it would, but then it's so it's just such an unreliable method. But actually, just showing up and doing writing something, yeah. even if at the end of the day is absolute garbage, you yes. can always put it in the bin. But I'm kind of I'm a big advocate of like subconscious processing, which is like mm. a lot of a lot of performers do as well. Like Segovia was was renowned for doing this. He'd work six hours a day in three groups of two hours. Mm-hmm. So he'd do like two hours in the morning have a break for however many hours, do something else, come back in the afternoon, break again, then come back in the evening. I think was it List as well did this. And I, I don't think at the time these people knew it was called subconscious processing, mm-hmm. but kind of when you reach that point of frustration and then walk away from it and do something completely different, the you know the subconscious is still processing the task. Yeah, the cogs are still wearing exactly, away, even yeah. though you're not aware of it. Exactly, yeah. and then you, you return to it and you find that you might not always have a solution, but you'll have like another thread to yeah, pull or a something. New inspiration. I yeah. actually find that strategy works with teaching as well. Okay. I had a pedagogy professor in mm-hmm. in Sydney, and he demonstrated that quite often if you have a student that's you're getting frustrated with, or they're getting frustrated with a particular concept, just ask them to do something such as 
shut the door or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. oh, would you mind just going and um, shutting the window for me? And then right. they come back and then it's like, right, where were we? And at least oh, you just okay, have that breath of fresh air or just yeah. getting up and having a drink of water. Yeah, just it so just breaks things up, doesn't yeah. it? Because I think it can feel like you're just bashing your head against a brick yeah. wall at times. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Where's this inspiration? Yeah, exactly. I, I can't no. find it. Oh, so I've not, I, yeah. yeah, I've not kind of, I've not thought about that in a kind of, in a teaching capacity before, but mm-hmm. I don't really teach. So that's probably why. <laughs> that's probably why um, you thought about it. <laughs> but yeah, often the first stage is just to put something down on the paper, isn't it? Or yeah, the yeah, metaphorical yeah. paper, because you can just get rid of it. Yeah, later. absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, I spend a lot of time in what's called pre-composition. So kind of working on the 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 kind of material, the building b- blocks, if you like, or the language that you're going to use to like write something with. That can take a long time. Um, and again, even that, you you just need to show up and work through the sort of ideas you have for it. Mm-hmm. I've completely forgotten what the question was. Um, no, I, that's fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Can't remember what oh, the it was. That, was it was that album. Oh, my God. I don't know. But yeah. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> so like, so um, <laughs> that old thing. <laughs> that old thing. So so this, what happened with New Amsterdam was I'd when the album was, like, recorded and mixed, I sent out a bunch of emails, basically, like, cold, cold, a bunch of record labels. Like, I'm, I, I don't know any record labels. Cold, cold. Cold, cold. So, like, not knowing anyone, <laughs> okay. getting, like, a contact, and then... I thought you just said cold, cold. I thought you cold, said the word cold, no, cold twice. A bit, like, classic advice, though, for cold calling people. <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying this. Just use first names. Oh, okay. Like, if I call, if I call up the Davina Shroom offices... And go, hi, it's, it's Daniel Elms for Davina Shroom. Is she around? They'll be like, who is this? Oh, it's, it's Daniel Elms. Do you have an appointment? No. But if you call up and be like, all oh, right, it's Dan, it's Davina there. They'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be through. That's really good advice, isn't it? That's yeah. mad, yeah. Although, personable. if anyone is listening to this who says, like, printer ink and uses that, I'm going to be quite disappointed. Um, uh, but moving on. Uh, so, yeah, so I sent out, like, a bunch of emails. And, like, New Amsterdam were... If not the first, then like on within the first like three labels that I knew I wanted to approach, um, mainly off the back of Roomful of Teeth, which is one of their vocal ensembles, which is like just a wicked group. I really, I really like them. Just um, have the image of a room full of teeth. <laughs> literally, a room full of teeth. Quite harrowing. So, so it's the the ensemble contains Caroline Shaw. She did a partita for Voices. It was um, I can't remember what year, but it was the the piece won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm-hmm. And it's just really, really fresh compositional voice. You know, it's not afraid to kind of take elements of concert music and and throw it against influences from other genres and other styles, which is exactly what I'm doing. And that's what the appeal was with the label. So I emailed them and didn't hear anything back. And I was like, oh, well, that kind of sucks. Um, So and then I emailed like another however many tens of record labels and didn't hear back from most of them either. Heard back from some, like a lot of... A lot of labels that did show interest struggle to kind of find a place in their catalogue for it because it's not because it's not quote unquote trad classical and because it's not kind of pop crossover mm. either. It's very much kind of doing its own thing. A lot of people struggle to place it. A few leads, leads did finally kind of come together, which I was really excited about. But then kind of on deeper inspection of the offers, there was criteria that meant I wasn't going to be able to do what I wanted to do with it in respect of the album was written around the time that I was doing um, a bunch of work for Hull City of Culture, which was 2017, which is where I'm from, which is why we're doing the Hull accents Hull. earlier on. Hull. And so I really kind of wanted to make a point of using as many people and like artistic friends and colleagues from the city as I knew yeah. for the whole thing. So some of the musicians used, but specifically the photography the printing of the artwork, the design of the artwork, even the manufacturing of like the CDs and the vinyls, they were all done in Yorkshire. The idea was to kind of celebrate a bit of the artisanal crafts, mm-hmm. if you can call vinyl pressing an artisanal craft. We'll say you can. I, I think it I is. Say. So yeah. artisanal, so <laughs> artisanal. Uh, yeah, and so some of the offers on the table would prohibit me from doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I wasn't on board because the, yeah. whole, the whole point of the album was, well, one, I wanted to finally release material that i thought was evocative of what i wanted to say and i was at a point in my sort of self confidence where i was happy to kind of put it on the line it's a deal breaker really you don't want that inhibiting yeah exactly because it's you know it's the first time doing this and if someone says 
what music do you write? I go, listen to this. I can give them a, a CD or a vinyl or whatever, and they, they can get a feel for the whole aesthetic and everything that I'm trying to achieve mm. through that. Whereas if I'm sort of bound to someone else's rules in that case, it wasn't really going to happen. But, you know, there wasn't any, anything else on the table, so I was kind of going to go along with it and kind of swallow a bit of ambition in that respect. And then literally, literally 12 months after I'd sent an email, New Amsterdam wrote back and were like, <laughs> oh, this is wicked. Like, oh, <laughs> do you wow. still, yeah, do you, do you still want to put this out? So I was it's, like, it's yes. It's always worth sending that email, even if it might take 12 months <laughs> to get a reply. <laughs> yeah, but that was great. So I finally like had a couple of meetings with the team on Skype and stuff. And yeah, they like, I was still really taken with the artists that they were representing and the focus on this whole sort of post-genre mm-hmm. style of music. And so it was just a great, a great fit. And so we went, we that's went together. Amazing, twelve months. Yeah, it's kind of mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so funny, isn't it? It's like <laughs> when, when you have a cat that disappears, and then twelve months later, twelve months later, I'm back home. Yeah. Feed me. <laughs> Where have you been? Yeah, yeah. And then how did that lead on to the tour uh, for the so, album launch? So one of the provisos with one of the other deals on the table was that there would be some sort of performance to coincide with the release, which makes complete sense. So I applied to PRS Foundation, uh, who I'd worked with on City of Culture 2017, and applied for their Composers Fund, Mm. because I couldn't afford to put on a tour myself. And just very fortunately, the application got through and it got approved, which is a good job, because I I don't know what we would have done had it not. (laughs) Um, Exactly, you would have had to sell a few positions. Absolutely fine, yeah. Um, So that was was just... Yeah, exactly. So that was just very fortunate that that all came together i think it was i think it all kind of came hand in hand though because the album had been finished because new amsterdam were on board and because they could see that i was passionate about putting it out it Mm. just sort of helped the application i think often those things all happen at once don't they yeah good things if they're meant to be quite often they'll all happen at the same time yeah it's (laughs) it's 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 funny how it happens and i also think like if you are sort of very set on doing something and people can get behind a a very sort of uh, distinct vision mm-hmm. that can really help things. I think people can sense authenticity. Yeah, I think you know, so. And that does play in your favour if you're trying to, you know, get somewhere. Yeah. With it. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of how the well, that's how the funds materialised, <laughs> and then um, and then worked with uh, the lovely people at Manchester Collective to help sort of organise the logistics mm-hmm. of the tours and stuff because I knew that if it's only a half hour record for mm. across like five concert pieces. So to kind of, if I'm going to, you know, charge ticket sales for a half hour show, there are probably going to be some returns. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. by sort of working with Manchester Collective, was able to work uh, alongside Vessel and Racky, who were doing Written in Fire, uh, which is which is a, just a wicked. Was it Written in Fire they were doing? No, it wasn't. I can't remember Damn. the name of it. But oh I, my god! Yeah, They're going to kill me. No, They're going to kill me. It's absolutely fine. Um, but it was wicked. It was very good. I actually went along to your album launch in Peckham. Yes. In London, I very sadly missed the majority of your piece. <laughs> absolutely fine. Not a problem. Um, but I did catch the, the Manchester- cadence. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I did <laughs> catch the, the cadence. Beautiful. It was incredible. Cadence. Soundscape. I did catch the Manchester Collective piece. Not that I can remember the name. Uh, Paradise Lost. That's right. Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost. Yes. Sorry, Racky. Sorry, Vessel. Paradise Lost. Well, look, I forgot the name of it as well. It's, it's grand. Uh, but that was a wicked show, though. It yeah. was really good. It was wicked to be working with them. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of, like, the performers doing my stuff, they're just people I work with very regularly. Including your fiancé. Including my fiancé. Does it feel weird to say fiancé? No. Oh, <laughs> I really struggled with the word fiance. Oh, really? I really did. I just it wouldn't it wouldn't come out of my mouth properly because I was used to saying Mark or my boyfriend or yeah. my partner for years and years and right. years, and then people were like, "Who's this?" And like my fiance, my fiance, fiance. Um, and then I started getting used to it, and then by that point, he was my husband. <laughs> and now you're still getting used to that, or is that? Oh, I think that's easier to say. Is it? Yeah. Hub hub dog. <laughs> Hubski. Hubski. Mark Hubsky. Oh, oh, yes. That's good. That is amazing. How have we not thought of that before? I don't know. I've copyrighted it now, though, so oh, you're going to struggle. It was quick. 
Oh. <laughs> that was that was good. Um, it was just you showing up. Um, <laughs> so, how was it going on tour and collaborating, working with your fiance? Yeah, She's it was often absent. Yeah, it's the the musician's life of of traveling around, as we were just discussing earlier on. Yeah, no, it's great. It's um, everyone in the band are people that I work with regularly, mm-hmm. and of course, like having Julia there was it's just great to spend that much time with your partner and on something that's like a you know a kind of creative endeavor yeah exactly it's like a really special thing to be able to do um so i felt really lucky to be able to do that and it was just a huge amount of information to just sort of force into into your noggin at one time because it's like it's one thing if you're if you're like performing a piece or having a piece performed and you kind of most composers you just you just show up for your bit and then you can sort of leave Mm -hmm. But then when it's like, you're kind of going through the, oh my God, I'm doing that indigestion thing. Are you okay? Yeah, it's fine. It's the old almond croissant. And, 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 are you, gonna, are you just going to talk through the... Like no. uh, yeah, when you are, you have this whole artistic vision, it's not just the piece that you've written, but also the performance and the logistics and everything yeah, as well. But yeah, so the, it's the it's the culmination of everything that is, that is mad. So like, you know, it, it's one thing to be kind of, going through and, and working out like the tuning of a particular chord at a particular point in the piece. But then once when, when that has come to it's come to a finish in rehearsal, you've then got to be like, Oh, did I buy enough rolls of duct tape? Or like, is the van still does it have parking? And it's like it's that times across like however many people are in the ensemble, which was like nine mm-hmm. for this. Um I was very lucky to have a, a guy called uh Tom Walker help me out, or Thomas I should say, who I'd worked with before at the British Film Institute, who was just like, he just made everything very easy, mm-hmm. um, just because he's he's super practical and logistical, yeah. and it's so stressful thinking about all those things. Mm. Isn't it? That's why, you, like, if I'm on tour, I feel so appreciative of like, stage managers, orchestral managers, because they're thinking yeah. of all these little details that you're not necessarily aware of, but you just know that if they weren't thinking of that, oh, it'd be a nightmare. Uh, yeah, absolute it's nightmare. Mad. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, my job is relatively easy. I just basically turn up and play and just expect that the music is going to be <laughs> right, there right, and right. that there's even going to be a seat there. Right. <laughs> so where did the seats come oh, from? The, well, I mean, it is surprising, actually, because I, <laughs> I did show up for an orchestral concert, and I'm not going to say what orchestra it was, but um, in the dress rehearsal, mm. there was no chair for me. Classic. Yeah. Classic like, cello. A, a cellist. Don't there even was, need one, though. There was no chair. <laughs> And so I think we just had to source chair. I don't know who was oh, responsible for that. In fact, I do know who was responsible, but I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> oh, that's mad. It's, stuff like that's happened so infrequently, though. Like, mm-hmm. the kind of the big howlers. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like for the most part, it's amazing that everything kind of works yeah. when it's like there's that much infrastructure going mm-hmm. on and there's that many people who each have individual needs. Yeah. And it's like, it's yeah, it's kind of just an amazing thing Mm -hmm. like these large groups and that has to be the default yeah because as soon as one thing disappears then you really notice it yeah yeah absolutely you notice when you don't have a chair (laughs) or or music (laughs) that's yeah that is another kicker really isn't it yeah (laughs) cliffhanger Hope you enjoyed part one of my chat with Jingle Elms. Part two will include chat about music for computer games, some surreal chat regarding birds, plus the wild card question round. How intriguing. Today's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from a whole bunch of you. I recently posted a poll in an Instagram story asking followers what music college didn't prepare them for. There were four options in the poll, and I must admit, I didn't put much thought into the options because I was in bed and probably feeling tired and vulnerable. But from the four choices, 54% of respondents picked tax time. Crying emoji. If you live in the UK, the time to finish and pay your tax return is the 31st of January. In Australia, tax return time is on Halloween. How spooky. And in New Zealand, it's some other time of the year that I can't remember and can't be really be bothered looking up. No matter what time of year it is, generally there is a mad dash to the finish line. 
There are numerous stories of freelancers surrounded by piles of receipts, trying to remember if they can expense that lunch from 16 months ago that was out of town, or if that black dress that you bought from H&M that you wore to a party can be claimed because you can also wear it on stage. Side note, totally. So, here in the UK, lodging your tax return and paying your tax bill rather horrifically falls at the end of January. You've just had December, where you've likely spent a whole lot of money on Christmas presents and socialising, and then you hit the new year, where generally there's not a lot of work happening. And then, bam! End of January. Time to pay that tax bill with all that money you haven't been earning. (laughs) What fortuitous timing. In Australia, it's a similar sort of thing work-wise in January. Teaching isn't happening because it's the summer holidays, but then at least you don't have to pay your tax bill until March, so you have a bit of time. I feel quite lucky because when I was in Southbank Symphonia, we had an accountant come in to tell us about how self-employed taxes work. And I remember him almost shouting key things to us, like, Save money as you go! Save money in December! You'll thank yourself in January! He told us this terrifying story about a music teacher who got audited. And they asked him where he did his grocery shopping, as they couldn't find any record of grocery transactions in his statements. He was then forced to admit about all his private students that paid him in cash, which wasn't declared on his income, but he used that cash to do his weekly shops. Needless to say, what followed was a rather crippling tax bill. I don't know what it's like in educational institutions now, but it seems that no one knows how to deal with tax until they have to do it. We focus so much on our craft that the practicalities of making a living from it get neglected and often with dire consequences. Now, I don't claim to be an authority on these matters at all, but if you're struggling or just curious to know what someone else does regarding this, then maybe you'll find what I do helpful. Or maybe you'll feel smug as your system is superior to mine. (laughs) Whatever. I set up an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> to log in my income and expenses. Again, an Excel spreadsheet is not something I learned to do in music college or even school. I don't know what I was doing. Probably just learning other things like how to write. And, I mean, Pythagoras. Sure, that's been really useful in my career. So anyway, setting up an Excel spreadsheet, that's something you can learn to do via the wonders of YouTube. There are people who actually make YouTube tutorial videos on how to do things like this. Lifesavers. So I've got it split up into months. You put in the date, the type of gig, what sort of transaction it was, like a bank transfer or a check. I still get the occasional check and it's a pain in the ass because they take forever to clear and you just think, I just want the money now. Why is it taking so long? I also very crucially write down how much I got paid. The spreadsheet adds it all up and it keeps a running total for the year. I also log in my expenses, split up into months, categories such as music, travel, accommodation, black clothes. (laughs) You can apply filters to these spreadsheets so you can see how much you get paid from a certain source or how much you really spend on trains in a year. I try really hard to update it regularly so that I don't have to do it retroactively all in one go in January. I then put my receipts into this really high-tech system. It's an envelope. I then put the envelope in a drawer and I try not to look at it ever again. So, I mean, I hear of people that use apps and take pictures of their receipts. That sounds like a really good option. In terms of saving, I set up standing orders for certain amounts to go out of my account each month. So, a bit for tax, a bit for house stuff. When we were engaged, a bit went out every month for the upcoming wedding. I mean, it's all very sensible and grown up. So, I have to counteract this by being childish and pretending to be a dinosaur sometimes. What do you do regarding preparing for tax returns and tax bills. Share your experiences with me and each other. Talk to each other. It's super helpful. This is how we learn. Anyway, that's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Dan Elms for my jingle and for being my guest. Always great to hear from listeners, so do get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Like and follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. Remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. Chat to you soon. Bye. 